Yeah, so in this second video, we are going to take a look at the decision boundary of the nearest neighbor algorithm or model. In particular, we will take a look at the one nearest neighbor classifier. So here I'm showing you a data set consisting of two features, x1 and x2. And again, the reason why we use a two-dimensional data set here for illustration purposes is that humans can't visualize data sets in more than three dimensions, usually. So it, it is just easier to work with such a simple toy data set so we can visualize certain things and draw certain things. So in this data set, again, we have five data points, the blue dots here, and let's just focus in on A and B here. And we are particularly interested in the decision boundary between A and B, the points A and B. So if you fit a one nearest neighbor model, given the data set, uh, what would the decision boundary between A and B look like? So with decision boundary, I mean um, a line or a boundary here uh, that divides between A and B. So if you have a new data point and it lies on this decision boundary, it would be equidistant from A and B. So maybe take a moment, pause this video now, and yeah, think about what the decision boundary would look like. Okay, so the decision boundary for A and B here, or the decision boundary between A and B, would look like this. It would be drawn here using a Euclidean, Euclidean distance uh, metric. So any point that lies here on this line dividing A and B, really any point on this red line is equidistant from, oops, equidistant from A and B. So distance between on um, the line and A and B is basically the same everywhere on that line. So if we would go have a, let's say a new data point here that we want to classify, it, it lies here. It's the same distance from A as from B everywhere on this red line. Okay, we are going to repeat this exercise now, but now we are going to focus on A and C. So what would the decision boundary for A and C look like? Again, it would be a line perpendicular to A and C, such that every point on the line is equidistant from A and C. So we would draw it approximately like this. This would be the decision boundary for A and C. All right, next we have C and D, the decision boundary for C and D here. That would be this line and so forth. And the reason why I was doing it is if we assemble all these decision boundaries for all the points in the data set, all the pairs of points in the data set, we would get the decision boundary of a one nearest neighbor classifier. So here in the bottom right corner, we have the decision boundary for the uh, one nearest neighbor classifier. And if you look at this diagram, um, you've probably seen something like this before. And this is called also Voronoi diagram or Voronoi tessellation. So we're basically dividing up the data set such that um, these lines are for each pair of points, the lines where each point on the line is equidistant to the two points um, left and right or perpendicular to this line. For example, this purple one is this one here, this one and so forth. Um, yeah, and this would be how we construct a decision boundary for one nearest neighbor classifier. But yeah, of course we are not done yet in the previous slide. I just showed you the decision regions given a data set. Now let's consider the actual class labels. So before I didn't show you any class labels, so every point was just a dot here. Now consider the same data set with class labels. Again, the triangles here are class one and the squares are class zero. So these are our class labels. And I've, oops. I have um, drawn them here on the left side. Let's focus in on the left side for now. So this is the same Voronoi tessellation that I showed you in the previous slide. 
except now I'm showing you also the class label symbols here. How do we actually get from that Voronoi tessellation to the decision region that the one nearest neighbor algorithm would use to make a classification? That's um, relatively straightforward. We would just take the union of those regions that belong to the same class label. So for example, if we consider this red triangle here, we know everything that is um, here enclosed by these lines is the region that is closest to this triangle. If I go over here, this region here, this is the region, the whole region here is the one that is closest to this, this triangle here. So we can also fill this out as red. Oops, oh, sorry. <laughs> so everything here on this side would be closest to the triangle in the center. And then everything here is closest to this triangle in the center. So we can also fill that out by red in red. Now, if we have this whole thing here in red, this is the decision region for all the red triangles. It's just the union because we know uh, for each one, for this one, for this one, and for this one, the triangle or eight triangle is closest to any data point that falls in here. So what I mean is if we have a data point here, it will be closest to this triangle here in the center and so forth. So the whole region here on top is red. That's the union of all the red decision regions. And similarly, every data point that falls here in this region will be closest to this blue square. So we can fill this out in, in blue. And every point that falls here will be closest to this square here. So we can, sorry, we can fill this out in blue here as well. And then when we do that, and we just think of the blue regions now, instead of the Voronoi tessellation, what we get is the decision boundary of the one nearest neighbor classifier. It's basically shown here on the right hand side. That is the decision boundary or decision regions. These are the decision regions of our one nearest neighbor classifier. Yeah, so to test your understanding, let me ask you a simple question. Let's suppose we have our data set with the five dots and I'm asking you which point is the closest to the question mark point. So maybe pause the video for like a few moments and think about this before I give you the answer. So if you have done that, if you paused the video and thought about it, maybe you would have realized there's one missing component that I didn't mention. So in order to answer the question, which point is the closest, A, B, C, D, or E, you would have to know how the distance measure is defined. Because um, yeah, it really depends on how we measure closeness or similarity or distance. So I just uh, give you an example of what I mean. So what I'm doing here is I'm uh, showing you the Euclidean distance uh, of radius one for this point. So let's just suppose this is a radius of one here, this um, dotted circle. It's the uh, Euclidean distance of one unit um, uh, around this question mark point. And if we use, or if we draw this, consider this Euclidean distance here, you can see that the closest point here would be would be this uh, this one that I just colored in purple here. This would be closer than than this point. Well, let me use a different color. So this uh, distance here is closer than the distances I'm drawing here in green. I hope you can see that. Now, if I would use a different distance measure though, for example, the Manhattan distance, the Manhattan distance is also called uh, taxi cab distance. So using this distance measure, you can see now that there's a different point that is closer now. And this uh, point would be this one that I'm coloring in green now. So in purple, we find that this point, this purple point here is the closest one. And using the Manhattan distance, uh, we find that this green dot would be the closest one. So what is the correct answer? Then? <laughs> Which one is the, pen, uh, the closest point? It really depends on the distance measure. I mean, there are different types of problems where you care about different distance measures and it's up to you to define closeness or similarity. Usually we would use something like the Euclidean or Manhattan distance, but there are also many other types of distances that we may use. 
Yeah, so here I have a list of the most common continuous distance measures. So continuous in terms of the features that we work with. One common distance measure, of course, is the Euclidean distance. You're probably already familiar with that one. And the Manhattan distance, uh, distance which is very similar to the Euclidean distance, but uses um, the absolute difference between two values rather than the squared distance like in the Euclidean distance measure. Just to make this comparison between Manhattan and Euclidean distance more clear, let's consider the Minkowski distance. The Minkowski distance is a generalization of the Euclidean and the Manhattan distance. And here's the definition on the right hand side of the Minkowski distance. So what we can see here is we have two data points, um, data point A and B, so it could be two training examples. And then we compute the difference between those two and take the absolute value here, so the absolute difference between the two. And we do that for each feature, J to M. So M is the total number of features in our data set. I just realized I forgot an index here. It should be XJ and XJ here because we iterate over the features. Um, and there's one parameter here, P. So if we set P equals one, that would be the Manhattan distance. So if we set P equals one, the P would go away here, right? Because it's um, to the power of one. And then one over one is one. So we can also cancel this one here. And then you can see the Manhattan distance is um, simply the sum of the absolute differences. The Euclidean distance is the special case where we have P equals two. So let me, sorry, let me erase. I didn't want to erase everything, but uh, okay, let me redo this one. So I wanted to show you the P here again in the equation. If we set P equals two for the Euclidean distance, we will have a two here, a squared term and one over two, which is a square root. So let's remove this one and just write it like, like this is maybe more clear, it's a square root. So in the Euclidean distance, we have the squared difference. So we still have these bars here, but they don't do anything because we square anyways. So we have the squared difference between two feature values, sum them up, and then take the square root to have the original unit back. Yeah, and that's how the Euclidean and Manhattan distances are related. Usually, I mean, in practice, it doesn't always make a big difference which one you use, but like you've seen in the previous slide, it can make a difference. So which one to use, it really depends on the problem. In practice, you can also consider the distance measure unless you have some domain knowledge, you can consider the distance measure as a hyperparameter, something to experiment with and to see which one, let's say, gives you better performance if you apply it in, on a real world data set. Another distance measure is the Malahanobis Mahalanobis distance. So the Mahalanobis distance is a distance that considers uh, yeah, the distribution of the features. So pre in previous slides, I mentioned that um, if we work with nearest neighbor methods, it's important yeah, to consider our feature scales. So sometimes or usually often, we want to make sure that our features are on the same scale to allow fair comparisons. Because otherwise, one scale or one feature will dominate in the distance computation, like Euclidean or Manhattan distance. The Mahalanobis distance takes into consideration the distribution of the data for each feature. So it, you can think of it as a distance that considers the distance of a data point to its distribution in terms of standard deviations. Um, yeah, we won't go into too much detail. There's one special case where Mahalanobis and Euclidean distance um, are similar, and that is if the covariance matrix is um, identity matrix. So for example, if, if I have unit variance, so I have a covariance matrix with ones in the diagonals, and this is a covariance matrix of the features, so x1, x2, x3 in this case, x1, x2, x3, and they are all uncorrelated. So covariance is zero um, for all the features, they are all unrelated, and uh, the uh, they have all unit variance in that case. Euclidean and Mahalanobis distances would be exactly the same. But yeah, we won't go into too much more detail about the Mahalanobis distance in this uh, class here. The last distance measure here on this list, of course there are dots, 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 there are many, many more, but the last I would say uh, relatively relevant one is the cosine similarity. So what's the cosine similarity? It's considering 
basically the angle between two features. So the, how can I explain this? Maybe think of the dot product. So if you recall the dot product, let's um, for simplicity use the vector A and the vector B and this uh, T is the transpose. So A refers to this um, X A for one dimension, oh, sorry, for all dimensions. Um, and the B is the X B. It's just a little bit too much. It's just a little bit too much to write. So we will just use A and B here. So if we write the dot product between A and B to between two vectors, we can also write it, if you recall from linear algebra like this. So we have the magnitude of A, which is a scalar times the magnitude of B, which is also a scalar times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. Now the cosine distance is, you can think of it as the normalized dot product, uh, normalized by the length of the vectors. Because if I want to get the cosine here, what I do is I divide by a times uh, magnitude a times magnitude b. So what I get is a transpose b times, or uh, divided by a times b times cosine theta. So that is my, oh sorry, <laughs> equals cosine theta. This is my cosine similarity measure. When is that useful? Um, yes, yeah, suppose we have a vector, a document vector representing a document. Um, and now using, for example, the Euclidean distance between two identical documents, we will find the distance is zero. Um, we will find, for example, that the cosine similarity is one, it's like uh, maximized. But now consider we duplicate each sentence in the document. So we just create duplicate sentences. If we, the more sentences we add between the two documents and we measure uh, the distance between the documents using the Euclidean distance, we'll find the more sentences we duplicate, the more dissimilar the two documents will become. However, if we use something like the cosine similarity, which me measures the angle between the vectors, the angle is not really that much affected by adding more similar words because the vectors or the words are, sorry, the documents will still remain similar because it's just duplicating content. So using the cosine similarity, we'll still find that we have two very similar documents here. Whereas with the Euclidean distance, uh, with every duplicated sentence, we will probably find that the documents um, become more and more different. So that's maybe one motivation for using cosine similarity. So now here's a list of the discrete distance measures, the most common ones that come to my mind. So one common discrete distance measure is the Hamming distance. And the Hamming distance, just looking at it, it looks very similar to the Minkowski distance or particularly the Manhattan distance. So we also have an absolute um, term here, sum over the M features. So the only big difference between this one and the Manhattan distance is the data input is usually binary feature vectors. So usually we have vectors that look like this. So machine learning binary, the term binary usually refers to values zero and one. So these would be binary vectors because they only consist of values of zeros and ones. But of course it's, it's kind of the Manhattan distance. So if we have two vectors, let's call them A and B that look like this, the only difference between the two vectors here is this one. So in that way, the Manhattan, dis uh, sorry, the Manhattan or Hamming distance would be two, right? So because zero minus zero is zero, one minus one is zero, zero and zero is zero. Here we have absolute value of one, another absolute difference of one, zero, zero. So in the sum is one, one plus one, which is two. So we would have a Hamming distance of two. Another common similarity measure, measure for discrete feature vectors um, is the Jacquard similarity or Tanimoto similarity. The word um, Tanimoto similarity is often used in computational biology. Uh, it refers to the same thing as the Jacquard similarity. It was just 
defined or rediscovered by a different person named Tenimoto, so which is why in uh, computation biology it's more often called Tenimoto similarity, whereas in data mining, computer science, and so forth, and machine learning, it's more often known as the uh, Jacquard similarity. How does the Jacquard similarity work? So let's uh, look at the equation here. So what we have here is um, an intersection term and a union term. And here I'm just writing it out in more verbose word, uh, terms. So what we have here is um, uh, two sets, a set A and B. So again, we have vectors, but we um, consider them as sets here. So just to give you maybe a more concrete example, because it gets really abstract here. So let's say we have the feature vector consisting of the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, something like that. Um, and then the other one would be um, let's call them 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we probably should use commas, otherwise it's not clear because we have a number 10 here, not 1 and 0. Okay, so we have these two feature vectors, oops, um, A and B. And let's construct them now as sets. Let's call them capital A. So again, 1, 2, 3, four, five, six, but the order doesn't matter here. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And what we would do is to compute the intersection, we would first consider what are the ones in common. So in order to compute this denominator term, we would find that five, six, here is in common. So the intersection vector A, B, that would be, uh, sorry, the intersection set, that would be 5, 6. And the length of the set here, this would be length 2, right? Um, OK, so now let's consider uh, the de denominator. What's the length of set A? These are six values. So um, let's do it like this. Length of A is 6. The length of B is 1, 2, 3. It's also 6. So we have 12 as the length here, uh, the combined length. So this term is 12. And then this uh, intersection term is again the 2. So 12 minus 2 equals 10. So the Jacquard similarity between the two vectors here would be 2 over 10, which is 0.2. So put it 0.2. We could also say some people use the word Jacquard distance. So we can also say it's a Jacquard distance of 0.8. So the Jacquard distance It's just the similarity, or one minus the similarity, sorry. So, ah, it happens all the time here, sorry. Yeah, somehow my iPad is super sensitive. If I touch it in the wrong way, it advances to the next slide. But yeah, also, this is all I wanted to say about this slide here, really. Yeah, so for this video on distance, measures and distance metrics. One uh, big takeaway is also that feature scaling is important for most of these. So for example, recap the Euclidean distance measure that we talked about. On the left-hand side, I'm showing you an example where the axes are on the same scale. So between, oops, between zero and five here on both uh, the x1 and the x2 axis. On the right-hand side here, I rescaled the x1 feature. However, I kept the dots at the same position just for adding a visual effect. So I just use the same dots, the same layout of the dots, but I just use a different axis. And you can see now uh, how the Euclidean distance measure would look like when I, if I expand 
the x1 feature. So before data point b was the closest one to the question mark. Now with this rescaled um, measure here with a rescaled feature, now c is the closest one, right? Because um, b is now much farther away because it's now uh, yeah, ten. Uh, sorry, two times farther away than before because I rescaled the x1 axis by the factor of two. All right, so yeah, that was a lecture on um, one nearest neighbors and some feature measures. So next we will talk about the k nearest neighbors method.